lobster is a lobster. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what uh, images come to mind when you see a lobster? Well, for me, since I'm the daughter of a Maine lobsterman, I think of family and friends. I can hear the cry of the seagulls. I can smell that salt air. And it's also a valid excuse to consume nearly half a cup of real melted butter. <laughs> so, happy thoughts, right? I don't normally associate thoughts of violence with the lobster, but there is a darker side to the catching of them. I'm going to talk to you today about an unwritten rule regarding the ownership of space that lobstermen do follow within their culture. And I'm going to go over uh, how this relates actually to other activities you're probably more familiar with, details of this rule, and what happens when this rule is broken. So it's really hard to imagine anyone staking claim to any one portion of the ocean. Nobody owns the ocean. How can they expect to do this? And in fact, if you hold a Maine lobstering license, technically you can set your traps anywhere in the Maine waters. So <coughs> why would any one lobsterman have a right to claim space over another? Well, before we get to that, let's go back on shore for a minute and talk about some examples of ownership of space that you're probably more familiar with. At the beach, what's the first thing you do when you get to the beach? You set up your area. You lay out that beach towel, you've got your cooler, you've got your buckets and your shovels, and it's pretty generally accepted that that is your space for the day. So it would be weird and unacceptable for someone to arrive and lay their towel down exactly next to yours. <laughs> Are there signs posted, $200 fine for beach towel infringement? <laughs> of course not. This is a rule regarding space that we just follow. Another example, a little more closely related to lobstering. Uh, Sunday afternoon, you're down on the bank of the Brazos River. You're fishing, you're doing very well, pulling fish in left and right. Somebody notices this, they come and stand right next to you, and they start casting. What might your reaction be? Well, depending <coughs> on how many Miller lights are left in the cooler, it could actually get pretty <laughs> ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so, though it would be annoying for somebody to fish right next to you, it would be annoying to have someone lay their towel right next to you. At least you're not out any money. Now, the stakes obviously are much higher when we're talking about a space that somebody relies on for their livelihood. So, I guess lobstermen do have rules regarding space, and they are twofold. Number one, if you do not live in a certain community, then you do not come into that community and set your traps there. There are boundaries that have been set over decades and decades of lobstering, and all lobstermen know where these boundaries are. They are as visual to them as that beach towel is to us. This is our space. Don't come in. Number two. You do not set your traps immediately next to uh, where somebody else has already set their traps because that is equivalent to that jerk on the riverbank mm -hmm. casting right next to you. So hopefully you can understand the lost friend's point of view and why when these rules are broken, they might get a little upset. So what happens when these rules are broken? Well, I talked to my friend Patty, who is a lobster woman in Maine and has been for several years. She's honestly, most of the time what happens, they lift up that buoy and they cut the line. And that usually works because that lobsterman is now out a whole string of traps, which is anywhere from two to 20 traps, a lot of equipment that they've lost. And whatever lobsters might have been in there, that's cash that they're not going to receive. Sometimes that doesn't work and it can get physical. <coughs> now by physical, I mean, you might just shove each other around on the wharf, or it could be as extreme as the New York Times August 2009 article mentioned, where one man had a pitchfork, another had a fish gaff. Now these are little fish gaffs. These guys weren't messing around. It can escalate more. Portland Press Herald article in August of 2010 talks about boats being cut loose, boats being burned, boats being sunk. But the worst case happened in 2009 and it made the New York Times that summer. I happened to be home and it was all over the news. Matinicus Island, it's smaller than Central Park in New York, 22 miles offshore. Lobstering is all these people have. So when some guy decided he was gonna come out and set his traps there, he lived on the mainland, <coughs> guess what? That didn't go over very well. So they went through the whole thing. They have the verbal warnings, the reliance cut, there's property destroyed. 
there were boats boarded, pepper spray was used. This incident actually ended in a shooting. Shot him in the neck. Well, fortunately, this man did live. But what it did was made local government officials look at the possibility that they should make a law that if you do not live on the Tinicus Island, you cannot set your traps there. So this unwritten law that exists for Maine lobstermen is taken very, very seriously. And otherwise normal law-abiding, respected citizens can get pushed to <coughs> threaten, uh, destroy property of, and possibly cause harm to their fellow lobstermen. So, was this old guy caught by somebody following this unwritten rule? Or was he maybe caught by somebody that was infringing on another's fishing area? Well, there's obviously no real reason, no way to know, but I do know this, either way, he's going to taste delicious dipped in melted butter.